Yeah. Well, I guess first I want to start just by asking everybody if if anyone besides myself saw the super moon last night. <laughs> did anyone see the super moon? Yeah, I did. Okay, cool. So I think this is just such a cool example of a natural event that has uh, it's it's culturally uh, recognized. You could read about it in the news and. You know, some people engage with it. Other people probably didn't even know it was happening. And I think this is sort of the point here is um, phenomenologically uh, what we consider the natural can be approached in so many different levels. And each person who saw the super moon last night had their own experience, I'm sure. And maybe there was some crossover. And I know my wife and I were checking it out. And even between us, we had very different relationships to why we thought it was impressive so that's that's what this that's what my project's really about is um the personal and and also socially uh shared phenomenological relationship to to what we're going to call nature for today but we'll explain what that might mean because it's not a, not entirely clear what nature what what a good definition is so I'm gonna go ahead and share. I put together a little presentation. I hope you like pictures. It's mostly pictures. Um, I think I can do this here. So I, I just want to also say I, I've never done a philosophy uh, presentation before. So this is really exciting for me. I, my, my under, uh, my master's was in history. I'm in the history department. So. This is my first semester even approaching uh, things from this angle, which is very cool. So thanks for the opportunity. So guys, I was, um, I consider myself lucky. I grew up in a swamp. I literally was born and raised in this place on the left here. This is the Honey Island Swamp. It's in Louisiana. And, you know, my childhood, I would come home every day after school and go into the swamp and I'd come home when it got dark. <laughs> and I spent, so I spent five or six hours a day playing in the mud, you know, catching animals. I thought it was sort of normal. I, I didn't know anyone lived in any other way until, until I left the swamp eventually. <laughs> so this is a beautiful place from my perspective, but maybe not everyone would find it as, 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 um, as beautiful. Well, so fast forward maybe 20 years, after that, I had an interesting experience. I was teaching English classes in South Korea. So you can see the picture on the right. This is the town, little town where I lived in South Korea. And one day I was giving a class and uh, it was a beautiful day. So we were outside and I invited the students to um, go onto the grass and they didn't want to. And I didn't understand why. And so we started talk. I started talking to the students. And eventually what I what I got from them was that they thought that the grass, but also the forest were dirty places. Uh, they didn't have a positive uh, view of what I considered to be something. I thought every kid loved to go in the forest and play. But these kids weren't interested in that. And they they, they had a very negative um, perspective of what the forest represented. So that was the first time I'm not that smart. So that was the first time I realized, wow, not everybody likes to play in the forest. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> so that sort of began this the, me thinking uh, about the perception of nature and how it might have a lot of variation and, and what the implications of that might be for some of our ecological um, Situ uh, the ecological situation we find ourselves in today. So that's my personal anecdote. That's the last one, I promise. Okay, so here we have nature's aesthetics, experience, attitudes, and truths. The last one, of course, is the most ambitious, but I don't know if we'll get to a truth today, but we'll try. <laughs> so on the left, you have this beautiful cartoon from Robert Crumb. Uh, he's one of the great American satirical cartoonist. And I just think this is an amazing cartoon because it shows 
um, a transformation of an environment. And I like looking at this picture from a phenomenological perspective, like, um, you know, if a child was born into, let's say, the third frame on the top right, what would that child's world be like versus if the child was born into, say, the bottom right hand corner, which is a slightly more familiar version of reality to at least myself. I don't know about everyone. It's interesting. And, and I think there's a there's a there's a point where maybe neurology can also enter into this picture. We'll, we'll get to that at the end. But, you know, surely uh, being born into these different versions of a physical environment uh, has in, undoubtedly has effects on the brain. So it's something we'll consider at the end here. So um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me and see the, the pictures fine, right? I'm not hearing any complaints, so I'm assuming that's it's all working. Yeah, it's oh, it's okay. It's okay. Go okay, ahead. cool. And look, anybody can jump in at any time. I, I prefer this to be as conversational as possible. Um, okay, so first we, we maybe need to try to figure out what we're talking about when we say nature. Um, Parsons first chapter, for those who had a chance to read it, he kind of goes through this issue when we talk about nature and maybe intuitively we sort of assume we're talking about the same things. But of course, like a good philosopher, you need to filter uh, a good def a definition, a working definition. So the one, the one that he arrives at, he offers from John Stuart Mill is what takes place without the voluntary intentional agency of humankind. Um, well, why voluntary and why intentional? Because if, if, we, have a, if we have a more basic definition, uh, a, what happens without human agency, we, we, would, we, would, we would arrive at the conclusion that there is no nature on planet Earth anymore because there's nowhere we can go on our planet that has not been severely affected by the actions of humanity, whether it's the noise of an airplane going overhead or just the changes to um, the quality of the air. So he, he, he likes to include voluntary intentional agency of man because then it frames it in a uh, slightly more, um, what would I say, concentrated form. Now this still to me gets problematic because if you look, for example, um, at the shark on the bottom right, it's tagged with a GPS tracking device. So this shark is no longer part of the natural world. I mean, there's a lot of ambiguity here because especially when we're talking about endangered species or climate variation, everything's being tracked and sensed and measured and, uh, can, and digitized now into databases. So the the natural world is now part of the internet of things, right? So this is interesting. It probably means we need to better redefine our definition or perhaps the category of nature is, is, is wrong. Maybe it's not, um, maybe it's not a use, maybe it's not a, maybe it's a useful term, but maybe it's not a real representation of reality. Anyone want to jump in here? Anyone else have any thoughts about this sort of internet uh, of things of the natural world? I think Nuno, you write a little bit about this sometimes. Is the shark is this shark still part of the natural world? Yeah, I guess I guess um, there are many issues entangled here because um, yeah, of course, he, of course, he is because I don't think that uh, tagging a shark will. Uh, fundamentally change his relationship with the, his surroundings and, and uh, <clears throat> the natural surrounding with his natural surroundings. Yeah, it, it can maybe it, it changes the, his relationship with the other uh, sharks or other beings that can see or detect as uh, in some way the the. The interference, equipment the, the device, the yeah. tag, but uh, but the device, but um, but I don't think it it changes uh, his relationship relationship with the environment fundamentally. One of the issues I had with um, I read the text 
and uh, I, I didn't read the whole book, but I read the, the chapters you sent. Uh, one of the issues I had was uh, with his definition of nature, uh, because um, I think uh, sometimes he, he makes a, a confusion between nature and uh, landscape and nature and environment. And uh, he, uh, he, he sometimes also um, is a bit rushed in his arguments. So uh, I think that, um, for instance, the, the category of landscape, um, we can speak uh, of that category mainly because of, of the modernity, of the modern age. And uh, I think he, he crosses that uh, distinction without stopping and uh, thinking about it because it, it is essential to, to recognize that for the, the ancient Western culture and, and even in medieval times, the, the landscape didn't, I wouldn't say it didn't exist, but it didn't exist as a, a philosophical and uh, um, meaningful uh, concept. So no, I think great. you rushed. Yeah. And I, I, I think agree he, with you. You know, one of the one yeah. of the reasons I chose this specific two chapters was because I think there are a lot of holes in it, and I think yeah. in, in order for us to introduce the ideas and uh, dissect it, I think it's sometimes it's good to have uh, something that seems uh, like there's some there's some points in the chapters where it feels like there's something wrong, something's rushed. But it's yeah. easy to read. it's easy to read, and it, I just wanted to use it as an introduction. But I would agree with you. There's lots of problems here, but um, yeah, totally. And and your 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 concept, uh, your your point about landscapes, interesting too, because in archaeology we do a lot of uh, archaeology of landscape and trying to figure out what the landscape meant to to very very different cultural. Um, you know, some different societies in the past. So this is this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. The historicity of the landscape and how yeah. it fits into the Western model. Yeah, but uh, John, the main... uh, another thing that uh, I, I thought about Internet of Things in nature, mm -hmm. Heidegger's conception of a framework or the gathering. There are different translations in English, <clears throat> but the way he used this word gestel in German by the way, uh, I think in Guilherme's presentation, the, uh, this uh, idea was uh, mentioned. The whole thing for Heidegger is precisely that when, when you don't have a human agency, then you have a different perspective of nature. And that relates to what Nuno was just pointing out. Because a landscape becomes a landscape precisely because uh, human beings are focusing on nature as uh, in some way are relating to nature that uh, involves some kind of uh, agency, uh, even though they are not exactly uh, intervening in nature in the way we think of it, uh, that technology does. Sure. Uh, for Heidegger, the idea is that, for instance, when you see a river, <clears throat> if you think of the river as a, as a place where you can build a bridge just to cross from one side of the river, uh, one bank to the other. This would be an example of Gestel. So every time you approach nature with this uh, voluntary or intentional attitude of uh, transforming nature, therefore you, you have a different conception of nature as opposed to the pre-Socratic, let's say uh, pre-modern understanding of nature, as uh, Nuno pointed out. So for Heidegger, of course, he tends to uh, romanticize or to idealize the pre-Socratic primordial uh, approach to nature. But I think he has a very interesting point, precisely because when you mention Internet of Things, uh, as in this uh, shark example, uh, it just becomes another thing among others, right? And uh, it's all part of a human uh, manipulating uh, nature. That's that's the point uh, for Heidegger. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, that's that's, that's an, an interesting point because 
the main view here is that uh, our fundamental modern relationship with nature is uh, one of uh, availability. That is, right. uh, we, 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 we uh, have a relationship with our surrounding, surroundings that turns, it, turns them into something that is available for our use or for our consumption. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, the, the, as we spoke in our uh, emails uh, the, the other day, the, the Internet of Things is a movement that um, is somewhat paradoxical because it's the re reification of, of something that was dematerialized. Our relationship with nature has uh, transcended all, all barriers, let's, let's say, all material barriers, or tends to transcend all material barriers. And therefore, there is simultaneously a uh, reification, that is, we put it at our service, and so we turn it into a mere thing available to us, but at the same time, it has no real tangibility. I don't know if the word exists in English, but I think it is. It, it, it doesn't have a, a tangible uh, character. And therefore, it seems to go uh, immediately on the other uh, direction, that is of dematerializing nature. And the Internet of Things seems to be another step uh, uh, in that process, paradoxical process of reification and de-reification. Uh, that that is entangled in the um, uh, if you want to take a political view of, of, of it uh, in that mechanism that uh, Marx already uh, uh, pointed out and others uh, that is the, the the mechanics of of capitalism the creation uh, the limits are transformed into barriers that create another area of of value production of value creation so. Uh, I, I think that's an interesting uh, uh, subject because it, uh, in some way, it uh, turns that, it, that makes that paradox manifest. It, 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 it becomes a, uh, uh, apparent, it, it's visible, some, somewhat visible, let's say. Sure. Well, thank you uh, both for uh, th those, those points. Um, let's just move on because I want to try to get through the Parsons text and uh, there's a lot to cover on each side here. Um, well, one of, the, one of the critiques of this definition, besides the ones that you both mentioned, um, is just the simple idea that, um, well, why is, okay, why even separate uh, human activity from that of the rest of um, the natural world. So here I have a series of pictures just to kind of show, you know, on the left, top left, we have a beaver dam. And on the top right, we have a man-made dam. And uh, here's an, a blueprint of an apartment complex next to the, blue, uh, the blueprint of, um, sorry, cross section of some termite mounds. So this is not a surprise to any of us. We know that animals construct things. They have buildings. They some some of them use tools. Um, and then uh, from another perspective, on the bottom right, we can see here uh, some aerial views of uh, agri human agri agricultural activity. And when we start to see human activity from a different uh, viewpoint, we start to see wow, it doesn't look that unnatural um, in form or in kind. So this is, this is one of the critiques he mentions. Uh, why even distinguish? Aren't, aren't humans part of the natural course of things? And therefore, should they really be separated so drastically? Well, he has some counter arguments to this. We'll discuss this too. I'm sure a lot of, there's a lot of ideas. There is a practical reason to defend the use of the idea of nature. Um, these systems, complex systems, whether it's the ocean or climate or uh, astronomy or ecosystems, they weren't designed by humans and we cannot control them. So if we want them to function, sometimes we need to get out of the way uh, or, or, or limit our involvement. Uh, which I guess is basically the ecological crisis. How do we limit our involvement in every single system that we didn't design? 
Um, in that sense, it could be helpful to just have that distinction between, no, that's a natural system, meaning we are not in control of its operations. So, and we don't usually understand its operations uh, to the degree that sometimes we pretend. So this is a really practical reason to distinguish nature and, and, and human activity. Again, it doesn't necessarily, I don't know if it reflects an, um, I don't know, an ontological distinction, but it's certainly practically useful, if not uh, in, an imperative. I had an interesting, just tangential idea uh, that's not in the book, but I was just thinking maybe this phenomenological um, awe that we experience when we're amongst nature, maybe it's part, of, it's related to this. Maybe we're fascinated by the reality, the realization that's, there's, a, there's these systems in place that we didn't, we don't control. Maybe that's part of the reason we find nature so um, endlessly shocking and surprising because it's sort of like, wow, how does that, how does that system work without humans? I thought we did everything. So, so that's just a thought I had. I didn't explore it in depth and it's not in the book. Um, does anyone want to jump in with this idea of uh, why we need the category of nature? Maybe some of my colleagues have some ideas here. And if not, that's okay. I can continue. Right. Again, it has to do with uh, technology, but uh, technology in my opinion, uh, and I follow Heidegger in, in this uh, understanding of a technique, is not only smartphones, computers, or whatever we think of technology today. Technique, as you mentioned for, from the previous slides, uh, you can think uh, in the way nature itself is uh, presented to us, and therefore human beings end up intervening in nature in a way so as even to imitate nature. For instance, if you think of uh, uh, beavers, right, doing uh, uh, things with uh, woods and sticks, etc., you can think that animals do something that's very similar to the way humans uh, use technology, right? The way they, uh, for instance, birds, when they uh, build their nests, they are doing some kind of uh, technology, right? Animal technology. But the, the major difference here is that for humans, there is intentionality. This was interesting that when you mentioned uh, Mill's uh, uh, dictum on, on nature, that this idea of uh, intentional, uh, deliberate intervention of, uh, or agency of uh, humans vis-a-vis uh, -vis nature this is how uh, nature ends up being objectified by humans, right? Because uh, we don't, usually we don't assign technology or even technique to animals, right? The way they relate to nature, because we think that animals uh, themselves are part of nature, as opposed to the way human beings end up emerging are of nature, even though they are also part of nature, as you as you said. But then I, I think that this is precisely because uh, in the way we end up uh, addressing, well, it's already very phenomenological in, in the way you present it here in this, uh, in this last slide, right? Because I think it's precisely because we end up uh, opposing ourselves uh, to nature or to the rest of the natural world as though we were somehow separated from uh, nature, right? So I, I think that this, this was precisely the idea that Heidegger had in mind, that there is this uh, distancing of humans, of a human essence, vis-a-vis -vis the natural world and I, as you mentioned, this uh, took, well, actually it was a Nuno's point. It took several centuries, right? 
we don't think that usually that the first uh, moves of human beings were already technological. Unless we, we think of uh, 2001, that uh, famous uh, a moment when the, the primates, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, this story, manipulating uh, bones and things. But that's precisely, it took a, a while, right? It took several thousand and uh, hundreds of years uh, until he, uh, Homo sapiens developed this uh, distancing from nature uh, so as to manipulate it in, uh, through technique and technology end up transforming nature. This is very interesting. But uh, for, for Heidegger, the, the precisely the idea of a techne, uh, the Greek word, is that uh, we have to see how it gradually end up uh, distancing itself from the way we think of uh, uh, technology in nature today. Because for today, it's almost, you know, when, when, you, when you ask people about technology, they think of smartphones, computers, they forget that, for instance, books we are technology, right? The first book was a, a tremendous innovative technological device, right? Because these are not a uh, part of the natural world. Uh, and many other things that we, we no longer think of as uh, technological devices. But well, in, I, in archaeology, um, in archaeology, yes. we're very you know familiar with the idea that technology has been around for a long time. <laughs> right. Exactly. Oh, yeah, Doesn't... that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Working in archaeology, yeah, this is true. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, that, but that's, that, that's great. I, I, I think you are, you are really allowing us to uh, rethink how this uh, idea of the natural or nature became something separate from uh, human beings. Right. That, that, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you. And, and uh, um, go ahead, Nuno. Sorry. No, no, go, go, go. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, this author doesn't mention Heidegger, uh, Heidegger. And I, I think that's, that's uh, something that's lacking from his book in general, is he doesn't really um, bring in all the antecedent voices that have already explored these themes, you know, it's kind of more of a reflective essay than, than uh, a yeah. philosophy, a work of philosophy, in, in my opinion. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah uh, uh, I agree. I agree. Um, he well, he, he does say that he 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 works within the analytical tradition, so it makes sense that Heidegger is not is not there, but uh, he loses some things along the way. Uh, I would say, but uh, I I love the way you you put. Uh, uh, you, you constructed your your slide because uh, I think that maybe the the the, the issue uh, and this occurs also in the in the author he he usually he seldom uh, he frequently uh, states that uh, we should keep using a certain concept because it is conceptually useful uh, that is he, he he goes around in his uh, justification of the use of the concept. But I, I think that um, your way of putting things here is a bit a bit um, more sophisticated and allows for a more sophisticated interpretation because maybe the issue is, is the issue is practical, but the answer and the answer is also practical, but the the ground uh, is not practical. So I, I, I'll explain. Maybe it is not possible for us uh, nowadays to. Uh, simply let uh, nature uh, exist, let it be. As Heidegger, for instance, thought we should do with, uh, with being in a very specific way. But uh, maybe it's not possible because we are uh, so much entwined with it that we no longer have the ability to, to dis distinguish ourselves clearly, uh, to, uh, to arrive at a clear-cut distinction between uh, uh, society or mankind and nature. So I think that uh, a, a way to to work around that uh, the, the issue or to address the issue is that is precisely to try to understand this absence that you that you uh, 
uh, speak of here because maybe uh, the the issue is not so much uh, to leave uh, nature in, uh, to its workings in our absence, but to to provide some meaning to that experience of uh, absence. That what I mean is this: uh, what you call here all of the natural is um, the experience of an absence of ground that we we didn't um, we didn't uh, make nature. So we experience some kind of resistance, some kind of um, uh, uh, powerlessness, let's say, sure. uh, regarding it and, and its processes. So maybe that absence is, is the, the, the experience of our experience of nature is, is linked to the experience of, the, of that absence. And therefore, maybe the, the way to address that absence is precisely um, through uh, is practical in the sense that it's political, it's ethical, and not uh, only uh, use uh, uh, letting it be or using it at our own will. So we have to uh, make that absence presence present, politically pre present as a as a um, a reference. Let's say as an uh, as Heidegger would say. Um, Das Grund ist Abgrund. The ground, it's the abyss. So maybe that absence, that abyss, is the ground that we need to work from and not, not go around it or let it be, simply let it be. It, we have to deal with it in our, in our time. Yeah, well, I, I think that's, that's key, right, is the idea of preserving nature, uh, maybe the way we considered it even 20 years ago it doesn't seem like a tenable choice anymore so I, I I think your your strategy is one I'd need to consider but uh, certainly pure preservation doesn't seem like it's an option at this point so we will have to figure out what that relationship looks like moving forward thanks guys um, well let's get into the uh, the, the book's called Aesthetics in Nature. So it's about the way we experience nature personally and, and, and collectively. So going, going back to the last point, can we sense the presence of nature, um, regardless of whether we all agree on the definition? We'll just leave that aside from now. I, I would like to just go out on a limb and say that most of us can say intuitively that we kind of know when we're in the natural setting Again, I, I don't know exactly if that's ontologically true, but here we have, I just, by way of an example, I have three different environments. Um, and I just wanna show how this is a little more complicated than it might be at, on first glance. So if we, if we take, for example, uh, a, a sterile, <clears throat> very unnatural environment, like an underground parking garage, I couldn't think of a more alienating environment. <laughs> But of course, it's full of nature, right? There's microbes, there's bugs, there's probably birds and bats. And, and even though it might, uh, it just feels like it's devoid of nature, it's full of natural life of some kind. Um, but from a human perspective, from a perceptual perspective, we generally like to be, uh, you know, things to be very obvious to us. <laughs> Secondly, we have this outdoor fashion mall that's been landscaped. Um, and there's access to the sky and there's a little uh, artificial water feature. This might be a little bit more ambiguous if some if you would ask somebody, is this an experience with nature, with the natural? I don't know. It, probably the answers would vary. Right. Um, but this is something Nuno touched on that I think is interesting when we think about a landscape and then when we think about like individual elements. So. I sometimes get uh, frustrated because I can't get out into the forest or the Saha as much as I would like. And then I have to realize, well, maybe when I'm just walking around the neighborhood, I can just look at the trees more, focus in on details and, and get the similar experience. So uh, there's, there's components that make up landscapes that are in and of themselves uh, an experience with the natural. So it could be an individual flower it doesn't, you don't need to be in a forest, I, I don't think. 
Well, thirdly, we have this rainforest here in the Yucatan, uh, part of what was the Ma uh, Maya territory or civilization. Again, I think most of us intuitively would say, well, this is really cool. I'm on a safari. I'm in, I'm definitely in nature. But uh, if you've, if you studied a little bit of um, silver, silver culture and, and the, hist the historical ecology of even the Amazon, many of these forests, they, they were um, fostered over thousands of years. So the plant species that we encounter in the Yucatan, as well as the Amazon, are, are, are there for, for, to a degree, uh, part of human manipulation of the environment. So even, even in a setting as uh, seemingly virgin and untamed as the Amazon rainforest, you're dealing with a very uh, anthropomorphic, not anthropomorphic, anthropic um, environment. So it leads one to consider uh, our, our phenomenological um, reaction to nature may not always align with the, the background story. So that's an interesting thing to, to think about. Okay, let's, let's move on to uh, Parsons. He talks about some of the frameworks that might influence one's personal encounter with the natural. And I'm just going to quickly go over those so this doesn't go on forever. Oh, no, first we're going to do this. Sorry, I lied. <laughs> he, he, he categorizes three. Uh, I don't know why, and he doesn't explain why. And this is one of the problems I have with the book. But he, he categorizes three um, types of aesthetics that he associates with the natural. The first one is kind of the most obvious, but it's beauty. And uh, he defines it as a certain kind of pleasing perceptual appearance possessed by what takes place and comes into being without human agency. So there's that, there's that concept of nature again. He makes a point of saying it's, it, from his framework, it needs to be beautiful for its own sake. So, you know, if you love going to the beach because you're a surfer, and so when you see a beach, you get excited, this would not this would not uh, qualify. Okay, so this is interesting because it touches on what both of the professors mentioned in terms of utility and technique. Uh, so you see a river and you think about building a bridge, for instance. He's trying to say this is something that you find beautiful for its own sake. You, you don't necessarily want to kill the tiger. That's not why it's beautiful necessarily. Um, well, then he, he mentions these other two um, concepts. Again, he doesn't explain why, which I find troubling, but he distinguishes the picturesque from the beautiful. He doesn't define picturesque, but I think what, what I'm getting from it, it's something about um, the arrangement of nature. And then, and then finally, he mentions the sublime, which we talked about a few weeks ago, the sublime being um, being uh, something that portrays the drama, perhaps even the violence of nature. So it's it's a little different than what we would consider beautiful. I also want to point out that you could have a you could have a negative reaction to nature, right? It could it could create disgust, it could create fear, um, it can create anxiety. So it's not universal. It doesn't have to be a positive experience. Case in point. If, if we were to look at uh, some personalized responses to the aesthetics of nature, right? Um, some people love snakes. Some people find them beautiful. Some people collect them. You know, they have hundreds of them in their home. <laughs> and other people are deadly afraid of them. Uh, and I, feel, I don't think it's as simple as saying some people have a phobia. I think what I'm trying to get at is our aesthetic reaction to some uh, to natural natural things is has a variety of responses. So this can be based on your personal experience. I mean, I grew up in a swamp, so I love alligators because I was always around them and playing with them and stuff. But I know not everybody loves alligators like I do. That's OK. <laughs> Capybara is another more local ex example, right? Some people maybe if you have a farm in, you know, uh, Ocampo, these things are a pain in the ass and you really just want to shoot them because they're always eating your, your garden. I don't know, but I think they're cute and cuddly, you know, for me, I think they're adorable, but some people probably think they're big rats. 
Um, and then of course sharks. Uh, famously, this is Donald Trump's uh, his Donald Trump's phobia is sharks, which I think is really interesting. Again, I love sharks, but uh, they're probably not for everybody. So our reaction to nature really varies, and maybe some people are just indifferent, right? Maybe maybe pe some people have no reaction at all. It's just this background desktop. Now we also have to consider cultural uses of the aesthetics of nature, right? Uh, I like the term biosemiotics because I I studied semiotics a bit in in my material culture studies. And the idea of biosemiotics is really cool because it's the textures, colors, sounds that the natural world uses to communicate and send messages, right? So um, obviously throughout our cultural, in various cultural contexts, each uh, biosemiotics, for example, a rose for us elicits an idea of romance or we have, um, you know, uh, animal patterns on a woman is supposed to be seductive and, and sexy. None of these things, well, I could be wrong, but I don't think these qualities are inherent in the natural forms, right? I think, I think generally speaking, we could say that we, over time, we start applying associations to the natural forms, you know, uh, hardwood floors are comfy and, and classic and and, and even here on the right hand side, I have a Maya uh, Jaguar God, you know, so sometimes they're cosmological, sometimes they're more superficial Yogi Bear. I don't know if he's in our pantheon of, uh, <laughs> of uh, cartoon gods, but still even Yogi Bear as superficial as it seems, this is going to affect a child's relationship to encountering a bear in the forest. So it seems silly, but I think this is true. The way we uh, engage with nature oftentimes is through these cultural forms that um, are certainly going to infiltrate our perception of the original um, content. Does anyone want to jump in here? I know this, I'm going kind of fast. Oh, once again, uh, it's so clearly uh, the case that Heidegger had a point when he was, uh, you know, rethinking the whole thing of nature. It wasn't only in this book uh, on the essence of technology. Heidegger's whole philosophy is uh, rethinking of nature somehow. Because his point is that, like in all these pictures here, as you, as you mentioned, cultural uses of the aesthetic qualities of nature. For Heidegger, this is the idea of uh, world making. But again, uh, Heidegger is just one author, and it's a continental author coming from phenomenological tradition. But if you think in terms of analytic philosophy, someone like Nelson Goodman or Arthur Dento or other analytic philosophers who also uh, wrote something about aesthetics or philosophy of art, they had this uh, understanding of uh, world making. Because in all these pictures, we see clearly that there is an idea of a world making, precisely as you, as you, as you speak of collectivized meaning making, right? So that means that civilizations from ancient Egypt and uh, all the way to, uh, you know, uh, cartoons, uh, they, uh, they show that uh, human beings have been uh, appropriating themselves some form of a world or worldliness, uh, the way Heidegger understood uh, world, because it's, it's very much the way we uh, understand ourselves as being part of nature and even the way we distance ourselves from nature or from this uh, natural world is precisely because we are making new ways of uh, going into different worlds. For instance, mathematics or physics, something that people do in a very 
theoretical manner in science. For Heidegger, this is also an expression of technology, of technique. Because the, the, the major point here, John, is that the Greek word techne, uh, which is usually translated as technique or technology, was used both for art and for science, right? That, that's the funny thing. Techne is not yeah. only for art. Some people yeah. think that, oh, this is art. No, it's not only art. Science is also technology. And the same thing, some people think of, oh, technology, this has to do with science. No, art itself yeah. is also a techne. When the first paintings in the caves that Merleau-Ponty you know, writes about, the Lascaux uh, caves, etc., in France, these were also expressions of techne, of course. Religion is also an expression of techne. We can think of religion in terms of religious technologies. So biosemiotics is very is a very promising uh, term for your work. I think you you, you are in the, in the in the right track, I would say, because semiotics are uh, broadly uh, conceived would uh, encompass everything else, right? It has to do with signs in all different uh, imaginable uh, sense of, of the term. That's very interesting. I, I really appreciate so far, you know, your, your presentation has been very, very uh, thought provoking. Great, thank you. And, and it's interesting, uh, Professor, what you're saying about the the biosemiotics, because I guess the question I'm trying to get at, and I'm just getting started, is I really want to find out if these the uses of these semiotics here are are truly arbitrary, or if there is something inherent in in the uh, natural form that has a, a pure psychological, neurological, uh, elicits a pure um, a predictable neurological reaction. So just by way of example, the the, the bald eagle uh, is now associated with American patriotism and war. But um, when they were trying to determine the, the national bird, uh, Benjamin Franklin loved the turkey. So the he proposed that the bird should be the turkey and he was furious when they chose the eagle. And so I just think, would history be different you know, uh, how, what would change if there was a turkey sitting in front of the American flag? <laughs> I'm kind of joking, they, but it is interesting. <laughs> I think this is a, a, an interesting approach because biosemiotics is a branch of uh, biology, of ecology also. Uh, it tries to uh, uh, present a, a different uh, way of, uh, of approaching the uh, biological and, and ecological relationships uh, um, and to, let's say, a, a way different from the traditional approach that is tied with function, uh, with form and function. Um, uh, everything is aligned to uh, preservation and rep rep reprodu uh, reproduction of the, the, the species of the, or, or, of the individual in biosemiotics tries to uh, basically um, address the issue, the paradox that uh, uh, act, uh, contemporary science, modern science too, uh, has to, has to deal with. That is, it uh, says, it says something about nature uh, as uh, supposedly as it is, but uh, it, uh, that says says it through uh, interpret interpreting its signs as functions. That is to say, that's um, somewhat paradoxical because you have, I say uh, something uh, of nature as it is, but at the same time I say it through a function. So yeah. it's not really as it is. Uh, so uh, biosemiotics tries to deal with that by uh, uh, presenting a different approach that is not tied to the form function uh, 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 entanglement. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, something, okay. yeah, yeah, the economy. And, and uh, it tries to uh, address um, this, these signs that you hear uh, say it are culturally related, but it, it tries to 
somehow to address them uh, on, on the other uh, interpret possible interpretation that is that the, the, the species itself or the individuals themselves are trying to communicate something of yeah. themselves and from yeah. themselves through these uh, patterns and through these colorings and through uh, these behaviors and, and so on. So um, that is uh, somehow a phenomenological approach, a typical phenomenological approach to read the, the appearances as they are without uh, without uh, referring them to functions, let's say. So I, I think it, there there might be a way to um, uh, start from this culturally, let's say, appropriated uh, uh, manifestations or signs, and maybe try to relate them to those uh, manifestations in nature as they are, without uh, uh, serving some kind of function. Uh, with sure. reproduction in sight. Sure, yeah, and it's really interesting to consider mo most of the biosemiotic <clears throat> manifestations are interspecial, right? So it's always important to remember the species are already communicating amongst themselves, in including with humans. So, um, you know, whether it's the color of flower or I was just reading the other day how the, the frequency of the dog bark is actually is perfectly designed to be the most irritating frequency for humans. So <laughs> that's fantastic for all of us who live next to people with dogs. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Uh, I've got a few more slides here. Got to get back to this. Okay, and then there's, there's a third aspect he mentions, which is uh, the historical um, historic, historicity of the of attitudes. So of course, this is from a very strictly Western European perspective. He mentioned if we were in Asia or, or Africa or, or Mesoamerica, totally different historical trajectory. But just purely from a Western perspective, um, I thought it was fascinating. Here's a quote from Parsons. Prior to the 18th century, it was difficult to think of nature as beautiful. And that idea would have been uh, alien to people. I think that's fascinating and uh, a little bit scary to me. I don't know why, but it just makes me uncomfortable to realize it could be so um, mo uh, changeable that this 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 sense of the beauty of the natural world is something relatively recent, according to Parsons. So we have an example here of a late medieval painting. Uh, this is a really cool painting in the National Gallery. And um, you can see nature. There's no attempt to reproduce it accurately. It's just this kind of ugly, disturbed place. And Parsons explains that, uh, you know, sort of from a biblical perspective, uh, the mountains were considered got, like forgotten parts of the earth. And it, nature was a place where God basically didn't exist. And uh, on top of that, you have the practicality of access to nature in the Middle Ages, which most people, they never left their little farming community. People weren't traveling to national parks for vacations. And it was a really dangerous place, right? If he was, He's talking about if you wanted to cross the Alps or the Pyrenees, you have a good chance of being killed by either a bear or a bandit. It wasn't until the 18th century when uh, changes in the economy and in political landscape in Europe allowed people to start traveling into natural settings. And of course, this was also the high point of romanticism and uh, re reinvigoration of the classics. So here we have uh, Claude Lorraine, John Constable, a lot of awesome artists from this period, starting to put nature front and center and, and and making that an okay thing to do, a tenable thing to do. Um, of course, going into the 20th and 21st century, now we're just familiar with this concept, right? Ansel Adams taking a picture in Yosemite. You don't need to explain to somebody why this is a, a beautiful photo, but it's really interesting to consider 300 years ago, it would have been baffling. Why would you take a picture of this hideous, ugly thing? <laughs> so it's always important to remember there's a historical aspect here. Um, 
Okay, so going a little bit deeper into the phenomenological experience, uh, we talked about there's the perceptual appearances of things, so the actual um, senses receive inputs, could be sounds, sights, perhaps taste, t uh, touch. Uh, there's, I have to move this window because I can't see. There's the affective element, and he's calling that the uh, kind of, I would just say the emotional reaction. So like the, the gut reaction, the first thing you feel when you see a snake or look at the moon or sit on a beach. So this is just kind of a limbic uh, reaction. I don't know if I'm using the right word. And then finally, he, he introduces uh, sort of the cognitive behavior, uh, cognitive reaction to nature which are all of our associations, uh, you know, beliefs. Here we have imagination, nostalgia. Maybe, maybe perhaps if you're interested in, you know, some of the science behind it, you're going to have a completely different experience than somebody who's just having a purely uh, aesthetic, uh, emotional response. And again, cultural meaning, historical meaning, um, these things all can play a factor. So I wanna do a little experiment here, just so I can shut up for a second. I'm gonna put some uh, images. I have two different landscapes. I'm just gonna put on the screen and I just wanna spend maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds taking it in. I want you to try to do some self uh, analysis, psychoanalysis, very uh, difficult to do. But I want you to try to do some self phenomenological analysis and see what your reactions are to the landscapes on, on considering all of these uh, aspects, both your emotional response, your initial emotional response, and also maybe uh, any associations that pop into your head. And hopefully somebody's brave enough to share their experience. That would be the, that would be ideal. So let's see how it goes. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm just getting hot. <laughs> so does anyone, does anyone want to just say what they, what their uh, phenomenological reaction is to this landscape in Portuguese, English, whatever. Just so we have some food for thought. É, pessoal, era bom que a, a todo mundo pudesse reagir também. Pode falar em português também, como o John está dizendo, qual sua reação diante desse quadro, desse, dessa foto aqui, desse desenho. I think I feel, I feel thirsty. Pode falar. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Nicholas. Go ahead. No, I'm saying that I feel thirsty. I, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't know if I should say that, but like one thing that popped into my head was like, you know, those, I heard stories that you shouldn't like drink water from cactus in the desert. because like, it might make you hallucinate. So I was thinking like, wow, if I was there, I shouldn't drink the water. because I might like trip or something. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. That's great. So there's a little bit of uh, previous uh, knowledge or information that you're associating with this landscape. É, eu eu acho que pelo menos eu quando observo tenho uma experiência, eu acho que uma característica que é inerente é tentar identificar padrões numa numa imagem, né, numa experiência então visual. E eu acho que quando nós vemos um uma landscape nós consideramos que se há algumas algumas expectativas são são satisfeitas em relação à identificação de certos padrões eu acho que nós é, podemos é, atribuir um certo valor a, a isso e e esse valor é pode ter uma relação com o que nós consideramos como é, belo ou sublime 
Então, eu, eu penso que a identificação de padrões dentro de um, considerando uma imagem, uma experiência acerca da natureza é um, é um fator que, que conta. Ah, oh, that's, that's great. And, and that kind of brings into question the idea of the golden ratio, um, fractals, these kinds of um, geometric manifestation uh, patterns that uh, are inherent in the natural uh, systems. I think you touched on it there, right? We find them surprisingly satisfying. And I often think about, you know, if somebody were able to construct The Japanese uh, have tried to do this in gardens, but if somebody were able to construct a landscape like this uh, as an art piece, I mean, we would just be, that would be the, the best piece of art I think ever, <laughs> ever created. So uh, there's an interesting thing here, just the pure visual uh, pleasure in these kinds of complex patterns, I think is something that definitely uh, comes into play. Thanks, thanks for that. Victor, did you want to add something? Uh, a minha experiência acho que vai ser um pouco particular, porque me lembram dois jogos que eu joguei, eu gosto bastante de jogar videogame, e dois jogos eu joguei que foram muito significativos para mim, que tiveram cenas do deserto. Um deles é, é de Bang Bang mesmo, de do Velho Oeste e tal, então... O cenário majoritariamente é esse e me traz uma sensação de nostalgia, uma sensação de um conforto muito grande, porque eu era mais novo e eu não tinha tantas responsabilidades quanto eu tenho agora, eu podia me dedicar mais para jogar os jogos de videogame e, e jogar eles bem rápido. Foi um jogo que me trouxe muita muito conforto, assim, muita liberdade também, porque tu podia explorar todos os lugares do jogo e tudo mais, e tinha uma estética muito bonita, assim como desse cenário. E principalmente, acho que me traz essa sensação boa também por causa do contraste entre as cores, são cores mais quentes, e principalmente contraste entre o céu e a terra e os cactos, que os cactos são um verde mais forte, assim, quase um amarelo, o céu é um azul bem bem forte, bastante frio, que contrasta muito bem com esse, com esse amarelo meio verde do, da terra e dá essa sensação de conforto bem grande. Porque o outro jogo que eu joguei, que se passava no deserto, não me deu uma sensação de conforto tão grande. Na verdade, a parte que se passava no deserto me deu uma sensação de desconforto e de tristeza bastante forte, mas não me remete muito a esse jogo. Me remete mais a esse outro e me traz essa sensação boa. Awesome, Victor. Yeah, that's something that I'm, I'm trying, I want to bring up at the end is you're talking about a video game or, um, you know, a virtual environment that's based on natural forms. I'm curious if a surrogate uh, experience with nature has the same or similar effects to being in the real place. I know I'm, I'm like you, Victor. I like to play games. I have a Zelda And uh, sometimes when I'm feeling uh, claustrophobic or like uh, quarantine crazy, I go into the Zelda world and I'm on the top of the mountains and the sky and I think, wow, this is great. I'm outside running around. It, it really gives you that feeling, you know? I don't know if it's mirroring neurons or what's going on, but that's interesting. Thank you for bringing in the um, virtual aspect here. Let's, let's move on to just one more slide, same exercise. And if anybody wants to say anything, that'd be awesome. You're not obliged to. This is a kelp forest. I don't know the location. Uh, anyone want to share their reactions or, or should we move on? Uh, 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 I would like to say that uh, uh, the, 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 slide, the, the slide before, um, I always associate uh, in, in, automatically uh, some kind of harried uh, landscape, um, harsh, uh, yeah. tough with this, uh, uh, it, um, 
uh, takes on an ethical, some kind of ethical, ethical, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, dimension um uh, and i love it um it's my favorite kind of landscape my favorite kind of uh, environment not uh, the desert per se but uh, those kinds of environment are are the ones i love the most and uh, this um uh, uh, the one with the with the, the kelp forest um and the, the ocean uh, in general is some um at the same time, um, I look at it with awe, but uh, with um, kind of uh, almost in a crying fashion because it's so beautiful. Uh, mm -hmm. I once, I once was uh, in in Malaysia and I did some snorkeling, and for the first time I saw those colored fishes and the corals and all of that and that, and it was an amazing experience that was uh, overwhelming uh, somehow and uh, that's not the experience i have when i am in, in those harsh landscape landscapes uh, this one has no ethical uh, meaning atta attached it's only that life fulfilling uh, experience at attached to it that's that's great the ethical aspect and i don't know it's interesting to think if for example your association of the desert with sort of a trial or tribulation is directly linked to some sort of films or if it, it again it could it be inherent in the landscape itself i mean that's the question right uh i, I guess it's not related to to films because it's not the desert per se it's the uh, every harsh landscape for instance the mountains or yeah yeah karst for instance uh, or even here in the, in in rio grande do sul the, the the canyons and those kinds of landscapes um have that effect on me but uh, uh, but uh, uh yeah the movies of course they have also that uh, some maybe they have some influence because uh the, those particularly the Western movies where those cowboys, the white, <laughs> the white hat guy with, that is also very tough and uh, maybe that, that has some influence, but I don't think so. It's the, the landscape itself. The rugged, you're talking, uh, the- Yeah, the, the rugged- the yeah, Rugged yeah, environment is, is a kind yeah, of- that's it. Yeah, that's it. It captures that. And it's usually devoid of life, you know, as part of that idea, I don't know. Yeah, yeah something like that okay well i guess we should move on unless anybody wants to jump in okay uh, john uh... yeah Diogo, por favor. Sim. Uh, então uh, sobre essas duas imagens anterior e essa uh, elas, nos, elas evocam sensações né e às vezes uma imagem no deserto pode uh, evocar uma sensação de insegurança, no sentido de que a escassez de água, de vegetação e potencialmente de, de alimento, o que poderia significar até uma ameaça à sobrevivência. E outras, se, por exemplo, projetarmos uma, uma paisagem com rios, árvores, é, um nicho ecológico diferente, pode é, nos invocar é, outras sensações. E Talvez a questão disso, relativo a, aos prazeres ou à sensação de medo e de insegurança, é, possa ser um componente chave né, na, naquele esquema que vai envolver fatores da percepção, é, os pensamentos e as representações, digamos, de alta ordem que as pessoas vão formar sobre essa percepção e o componente da, da afetividade, que, que parece ser integrante de uma, de uma noção geral daquilo que as pessoas podem considerar como, como algo, é, na, na experiência estética deles, como algo belo. Uh, a questão é que, é, relativa àquela segunda pergunta que você colocou no, no e-mail sobre a, a sua, sua experiência estética da natureza, ela pode ter componentes universais ou se ela... 
é, o céu pode ser compreendido, então, dentro de noções perspectivistas ou é, é, na, na falta de uma justificativa ou de um argumento para definir um critério, aquilo que é, que é belo. Uhum. Uh, uh, alguns estudos, quando essa questão da experiência estética é abordada por cientistas da cognição, que realizam algumas experiências com indivíduos de diferentes locais do, do, do planeta e tal, para tentar ver se existe algum elemento algum elemento que possa ser comum a todas essas experiências. É, eles é, Alguns apresentam que... É, então, é, é uma, uma pergunta que eu quero fazer. Alguns apresentam que possa ter alguns elementos-chave, alguns elementos universais, e que esses elementos não são rígidos. Porque eles podem ser elementos que podem que, que interagem com as diferentes experiências que os indivíduos têm e com as particularidades dos nichos ecológicos onde os indivíduos vivem, porque isso pode influenciar as experiências que as pessoas têm. Então, é, um indivíduo que vive próximo a, a, a um, um nicho ecológico semelhante a um deserto é, pode considerar que fatores que lá existem são aquilo que compõe a experiência a experiência é, visual que ele teve durante a vida dele, enquanto que em outros lugares outros fatores são são considerados. Mas o, o, os pesquisadores mostraram que existem algumas características que são comuns desde a, a, a fase inicial da experiência sensorial, como algumas cores, por exemplo, algumas tonalidades de, de verde que remetem à vegetação, algumas tonalidades de azul que podem remeter a... a, a a água ou a ou um céu limpo, né? E, e alguns outros elementos, como presença de animais, etc. Variando para cada nicho ecológico onde, por exemplo, uma pessoa vive. Então, é, seria estranho é, apresentar uma imagem para alguém que vive num certo local onde não há ursos, né? Mas, é, se as pessoas vivem num local assim, elas podem considerar que é que essa imagem ela tem um padrão referente ao nicho ecológico dela. E, e esse padrão ele pode ser preenchido com as diferenças dentro da dentro da, da, da cultura de cada pessoa ou dentro do nicho ecológico que cada pessoa vive. Então, um sujeito na África vai considerar leões, ou sure, alguém que sure. vai considerar... Então, a minha pergunta seria se você acha que faz sentido que existem alguns fatores que são... É, universais ou algumas formas que são sure. comuns a todas essas experiências que podem ser um influenciador na experiência estética das pessoas acerca da natureza. Sure, sure. Well, I think that's a great question. And obviously, if you're going to do a comparative study, you would need to account for those uh, geographical or, or contextual differences. Maybe perhaps the best baseline would be like using the moon right because you have to use something that everybody can see or that everybody has the same access to because that's another huge question here and it, it touches on a political question is the accessibility to nature um, is a major factor they talk about uh nda nature deficiency disorder ndd yeah <laughs> but yeah no diogo i i totally agree um people are gonna have a perspective based on their uh environmental biography so the question then becomes how can we uh you have a universally applicable nature that we can use as a baseline because of course every natural element every individual biosemiotic is going to bring with it a different response depending on who you ask and of course that will be distinguished between regions and biomes throughout the world So there'd be need to be a way, maybe you present them with a, uh, you know, if you're going to do a study like this, maybe you present them with a hundred different images of various forms of nature and then try to get a general response uh, numerically or something like that. So it's not so, you know, leaning one way. But I would, I would assume, Jogo, for sure, like people who grow up in the country are going to have more emotional attachment to nature than people who grow up in suburbia, right? I mean, that seems almost like a given. So when you're, I guess when you were trying to find a universal, there's a lot of context that we need to account for. I don't, 
I don't have a methodology and I haven't even explored studies enough to know if people have tried to do this. It sounds like maybe you're saying there are some studies that have done this. Can I, can I make a, a, a suggestion? John? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about that because uh, you're talking about uh images uh, of nature that bring i don't know like an emotional response yeah. and when we saw the image of the desert there were like plants and like a, a biotic environment and now we're seeing the fish in the water yeah but i also think it's interesting i don't know if you thought about that but it's interesting to think that there are abiotic uh, environments like as you said like the moon or Mars, like we, uh, this, uh, I think it was this week, we got our first colored pictures of Mars. Yeah. And I saw those pictures and I thought, my God, that's so cool. Yeah. And those, uh, and to me, even those environments are abiotic, like they don't have any form of life as far yeah. as we know it. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's nature, right? It's to nature, sure. like, or like pictures of the corona of the sun. Or, that's a supernova, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, like uh, those forms of nature that like don't involve life. Those, uh, I, I don't know, to me, those are some of the images that like really speak to me. I really like to see images of space and universe and stuff. And they don't involve any form of like life, except the life that observes the thing. So maybe yeah. it, it would be interesting to, to put this in perspective. That nature doesn't have to involve life or, or things like that. Yeah, I mean, in in that sense, because we're talking about systems that aren't under the agency of humans, so could even be like a flame, right? You yeah, stare, yeah. You stare at a campfire. Maybe you were the catalyst for its existence, but once the flame gets going, you're not involved anymore, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point too. So. Maybe that, Diogo, eu não, eu não sei o que você acha sobre esta ideia, mas talvez precisamos usar como um baseline, uma forma de natura, uh, como fogo, não? Algo que todo mundo tem acesso, todo mundo tem familiaridade, e vamos ver que, que são as reações deste tipo de uh, ambiente. Maybe that's our best hope. Well... Shall we move on? I don't know. Is any Jogo? Did you want to say anything else, or Nicholas? Or did you have any other? Uh, that was a really, really important point. No, uh, that was my point. I'm really enjoying your presentation. Cool, cool. Well, let's move on then, Jogo. Stop me if you want to jump in here, okay? Um, wow. Maybe. I, oh, that's cool. Nice. Okay, so now we've kind of arrived at a point where we're sort of starting to look like a, a postmodern position towards nature. Like, oh, everyone has their own personal history. Everyone has their own references. Everyone has their own baggage. So maybe it's just uh, anything goes. At least that's the way Parsons explains postmodernism. Again, I think his uh, definition in, of postmodernism is a little superficial, but it, it is what it is. So he says, um, he says there's two main critiques to this perspective of a postmodern position towards nature. One is that uh, nature is not art. So there's no, there's no dialogue between the artist and the public or there, in this sense, it doesn't make sense to critique nature. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that because He's associating postmodern with postmodern art, and I think they're two different things. The second critique is more important, I think, which is that if if nature is just a filter for our own psychology, then we're not really letting nature um, exist on its own terms, right? So it's sort of like what the professors were alluding to at the beginning, like if nature is just a canvas for our manipulation, that could also include our phenomenological selves. So we're just, this is sort of a narcissistic uh, view of nature where nature is the reflection pool 
and we're just sort of looking in and applying our own uh, feelings, imaginations, history, cultural beliefs. And, and, and Parsons uh, kind of intuitively says, this isn't really ethical because nature, at least as far as, uh, unless you're a, a creationist, nature doesn't exist for at, at, at our behest, right? It's not something that um, is there purely for our own self-reflection. So he says there's something wrong with just accepting a postmodern view. This is where I think it gets interesting because, okay, we've, we've determined that everyone has a different reaction to nature, but now, now that now they're studying the effects of nature on our bodies, on our minds, and they're finding that it has a huge effect. So just some of the uh, things that happen when you're exposed to nature, um, you know, lower blood pressure, increased anxiety, boost your immune system. You feel better about yourself. You feel better about your relationship with other people. So, okay, so now we have a measurable data set that's saying that being in these natural environments makes you feel makes you a better person uh psychologically and also neurologically and physiologically so if nature is so subjective to our personal psychology why would it have this universal effect is it a placebo effect well this needs to be explored more because we have a we have a confusion here between causality and correlation, right? Because if I go into a forest, I'm getting cleaner air, I'm exercising, I probably have the day off. So there's a lot of other factors that are making me feel great that day, and and how much of it is the contact with nature? That's a that's a that's a question. Um. Yeah. So this needs to be explored more. It's, they, there's a lot of studies about this. They all point towards a positive effect of nature, contact with nature on our bodies. My question would be um, the following, right? Are these neuropsychological benefits cross-cultural? So if I go back to my, my students, I was teaching in Korea who thought the forest was a dirty place. Well, if I was able to convince them to go on a walk in the forest, would they have the same benefits as somebody who is excited to be there? That's that's an interesting thought and could tell us a little bit about what's going on. And then going back to Victor's uh, point about the video game, could these same effects be produced with surrogates? So this is actually my, my project, my doctorate project is looking at uh, biosemiotics in our domestic space. And I'm trying to find out if they're there to replicate the effects of the natural world on our neurology and well, neurological well-being, or if, if we cannot replace nature. So even if you had a beautiful VR experience of the forest, it's not going to provide the same benefits as being in the real place. And then finally, I have kind of a more uh, politically charged question which is, do we need to develop this phenomenological relationship, positive relationship with nature in order to behave in a ecologically minded way? So, so how do I put that? If you're more aware of the aesthetic qualities of nature, are you more likely to um, make decisions with that in mind? Again, I don't know, maybe there's, a lot of studies that have already been done about this, but I'm just getting started. So I haven't really dived into the research, but that's it. So, so um, thanks again for your time and uh, thanks for putting up with a different language. I hope you found it a benefit rather than a, um, a challenge, uh, but thanks again for everyone contributing too. That was awesome. Very, very good. Well, thank you, John. This was a marvelous presentation. Very, very intriguing and uh, thought-provoking. Great. Glad you liked it. Uh, these uh, great questions to think about. And let's proceed to the discussion.
e pode ser em português também, é, tentar retomar essas perguntas levantadas pelo John na sua apresentação. É, são muitas questões, né? são, são muitas coisas que a gente pode a, discutir aqui. Já, várias já foram discutidas, não é, John? Porque você fez uma apresentação muito interativa, so there was very good interaction, and so many uh, discussions were already being uh, carried during the presentation itself. So let's let's move on with more questions and more discussions. Então está aberta a palavra. Quem quiser colocar mais questões, problemas para o John, por favor. Sobretudo quem não falou ainda. Paulo, a Carlo, a Thaís, o Victor quiser falar mais alguma coisa, fiquem à vontade. Eu gostaria Eu... de colocar uma questão. Posso ou tu preferir antes, Nicolas? Não, chama, Carlo, pode vir. Não, uma coisa rápida, assim, só aquela discussão inicial a respeito do conceito de natureza me parece que é bastante vinculada ainda ao legado cartesiano, né? em que nós temos aí uma natureza objetiva e mecânica. E nós, humanos, nos contrapomos a ela como uma subjetividade que tem contingência e liberdade. Então, nós, como este, como este ponto de, de, que põe contingência no mundo, digamos assim, e, e que dessa forma ficamos contrapostos a ela. Então me parece que, que fica ainda bastante vinculado a esse entendimento, de certa forma, que carrega um dualismo. né? E, e me parece que o conceito de natureza versus a artificialidade humana é é muito é, vinculado a esse dualismo. Uh, Carlo, that's that's uh, that's really cool to bring in the Kantian uh, dualism there. Um, I don't think I'm very qualified to speak on that because I haven't studied Kant. I've just read read the books. That nothing beyond that. Um, but maybe uh, one of our professors could add to that concept of the individual dual, uh, dualism applied to this larger question that I think maybe is somewhat connected to what. Uh, pr the professor was talking about earlier with uh, Heidegger, but I'll leave that to somebody more qualified to speak on it. Yeah, I could um, I could refer you all to our discussions in the seminar of um, theories of justice. Uh, they are available at uh, in YouTube uh, um, in the Professor Anita Mars uh, channel. Uh, we are precisely among the other things we are discussing those that the, the dualism between society, society and nature and how it's, uh, it it became uh, one of the drivers of the ecological crisis. Um, so if you have interest in, interest in that, you can uh, watch the, the videos. They are available for free, of course. Uh, but uh, that's an, an interesting point and a decisive point. And phenomenology somehow, the ph phenomen phenomenology uh, approach to these issues tries to uh, transcend or surpass uh, the, the dualism precisely by bringing together uh, the notions in some kind of... Um, Well, I, I will uh, address it with an example. Hannah Arendt, for instance, she, she talks about the nature as some kind of natural world uh, in, in which we are involved in a metabolism. Uh, she, re she is referring to, of course, to Marxian uh, categories, but, um, uh, and therefore it's, it's a, a, a kind of a relationship where, where it is very difficult to distinguish between uh, the human side, the society side, and, and the natural side. And I think that's the, our current point of departure. It's not as in, the, in Cartesian philosophy that uh, uh, Carlo mentioned. Uh, we had those, this, the distinction were, were, was clear cut. And nowadays, our point of departure is the indistinction. 
So uh, what we have uh, and in Arendt's world that constitutes society. The social experience is, a, is not society and nature side by side, but in th their entanglement, their confusion, let's, let's say. And politics it's, is, uh, and ethics are uh, the practices that try to establish, establish the limits, the distinction between one and the other. But the distinction is never clear cut. So that's our situation nowadays, I think. So, and, and Cartesian metaphysics and Cartesian dualism obviously contributed to, to the ecological crisis because it, it made nature something merely um, available to us. And, and Heidegger's criticism, criticism uh, and um, approach is to criticism to technology. Is, is really a criticism of this dualism also. Um, so that's an interesting uh, point. And it, it, if you have interest, you can check our uh, discussions in the other seminar. Legal, muito obrigado. Thanks, uh, Carlo. Uh, all right, uh, John. Uh, we have two more uh, uh, colleagues here that would like to raise questions. Uh, yeah. Vitor and um, Guilherme. I think Nick would maybe wanted to say something to that. And Nicholas, end. right. Cool. Oi, Vitor. Oi, eu só vou perguntar antes dos colegas, então, se eles não se importarem, porque eu não vou poder ficar até o final do encontro. Mas. A, a pergunta também era sobre o, o dualismo, mas eu acho que um sentido um pouco diferente. É uma coisa que eu que eu fico pensando que às vezes me parece, eu entendo essa separação entre ser humano e natureza, mas por outro lado, ou, ou do que seria natural e do que não seria natural, mas por outro lado eu fico pensando se essa separação faz sentido, pensando numa perspectiva mais mais amplo assim, por exemplo, as construções de prédios ou a construção de qualquer coisa que os seres humanos promoveram. Tudo isso se utiliza de recursos naturais, tudo isso se utiliza de tudo que está disponível na natureza, sem contar o fato de que o ser humano também é um, um animal que faz parte da natureza. Então, falar de coisas que não são naturais seria separar o mundo entre algo que está na natureza, que é possível de existência, porque tudo que existe, se for pensar nesse sentido, seria a natureza, e o que seria não natural não poderia existir, porque só existe aquilo que é, que é natural, que faz parte da natureza, que é o universo em que nós vivemos. Então, se for pensar essa perspectiva... Falar daquilo que não é natural é como se existisse algo que não poderia existir, porque eu estaria pensando numa perspectiva de que a natureza é um todo que faz sentido, ainda que possa ter suas contradições, mas que faz sentido uh, no sentido de que sempre busca um equilíbrio, sempre busca se equilibrar através de opostos, através de contrapontos. Por exemplo, se a gente explora a natureza demais provavelmente uh, ela vai causar a nossa destruição. Então, para se preservar, ela causaria a nossa destruição ou ela se transformaria completamente num mundo caótico, mas isso não seria algo não natural, seria só outra forma de manifestação da natureza que permitiria outras formas de existência, ou não de existência, mas outras possibilidades. Então o que a gente considera como natural agora e como natureza seria só uma manifestação de uma das possibilidades daquilo que existe no nosso universo. Mas aquilo que a gente poderia considerar como não natural, como, por exemplo, a, a pandemia, é, eu acho que é relativo dizer que a pandemia não é não natural, mas acho que dá para entender o que eu quero dizer com isso, que foi algo que poderia ser evitado, enfim. Uh, na verdade, seria algo natural também, porque a forma que essa é, é, é a forma que o vírus tem 
de tentar manter a sua própria existência, assim como nós temos a forma de manter a nossa própria existência, e assim como tudo tem sua forma de manter a sua própria existência, e a natureza seria ca caracterizada por esse embate eterno entre as formas de existência de não existência, enfim. Queria saber o que tu acha disso. E sobre os videogames, eu, eu particularmente acho que não proporciona a mesma experiência mas eu acho que proporciona uma experiência muito boa. Em alguns casos, eu me arrisco a dizer que até no mesmo nível hierárquico, assim, pelo menos de significado para minha vida, mas é uma experiência diferente e talvez justamente por ser uma experiência diferente acaba tendo, tendo esse nível hierárquico tão grande, dependendo da experiência. Ótimo, Vitor. You know... When you were asked, when you were explaining this concept of the relationship between the natural and the unnatural, I was thinking back to uh, anthropology, and you know, we don't have to we don't have to um, invent alternative models for these to explore this relationship because we have so many from uh, eth ethnology, ethnographic studies, archaeology there are so many different ways to divide the natural and the unnatural besides the, the Western capitalistic model that we've, we've been discussing today. So I think it's interesting. I, I don't know if it goes directly to your question, but we have alternative models available to, to, to um, use as references. What it's like, for example, uh, there's a great Brazilian anthropologist, uh, Viveiros, Viveiros, I'm sure Nuno is familiar with his work, but he, he, he tries to explain, it's very hard to explain other ontologies regarding nature, but he tries to explain um, how in some of the indigenous societies, they have very um, contrapunctual ver visions of nature where, um, for example, all of the natural elements are humans Have the, have the identity of humans, but take on various forms. Um, of course, the language is kind of clumsy and it doesn't translate great, but it's basically the idea that there are, very, there, there are already pre-existing alternative models to the one that we're discussing. And I think it has ecological, when you're talking about balance and uh, pressures on the environment, These, these ontologies have huge ecological consequences because depending on how uh, the, the society constructs what is natural and what is not natural, it, it inf inflects in our, uh, reflects our behavior, the way we approach nature. So this, it's important to remember anthropologically speaking that this uh, idea of technique and uh, is not the um, status quo. That's my perspective. I think there are different ways to approach nature that are already being that are already in use. It just happens not to be the model that uh, we've adopted. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this guy's fantastic. If you want to start to explore alternative models to thinking about the ecology that are being applied in in, in other societies, this guy's a great place to start because, I mean. The language is such a barrier when you're trying to explain these alternative models, but I, I think it's it's helpful to realize we're talking about a very specific um, viewpoint. Sorry, I gave you a long answer, Victor. Obrigado. Vou, vou dar uma procurada, inclusive. Estás aí, Guilherme? Estou sempre, claro, professor. João, parabéns pela apresentação. Uh, excelente, compartilho muito das questões contigo, porque minha pesquisa concerne também a questões estéticas, né? filosofia da arte. E queria saber de ti, assim, se tu faz alguma relação uh, também com com as questões do sublime e que o romantismo uh, fazia Uh, colocando, por exemplo, uma obra de arte que retrate a natureza como superior à própria natureza, né? E aí as suas relações, inclusive, com, com a melancolia, uh, o dualismo dos extremos, né? 
como o Panofsky colocava, e, enfim, a, a posição reflexiva diante da natureza, né, diante dessa imensidão, dessa, dessa, dessa coisa tão grandiosa que a gente não, não tem poder né, sobre ela, digamos assim. Uh, enfim, queria saber de ti se, se tu pensa também essas relações entre a natureza e, e por exemplo, uma pintura de paisagem. Uh, enfim, o que, que tu acha? Ah, não, that's awesome, Guia. Yeah, I and I love art history, although I'm, I'm, I'm not really so well versed in it. Eu acho que este período, o romantismo, é, é importante lembrar porque provavelmente todo o arte é, é, está utilizado por um grupo elito, não? Um, um classe bem alta na sociedade, um parte bem pequeno do população. Eu acho, não sei, mas meu, meu intuição sobre este período é que a, a arte tem um ligação forte com literatura, não? É, por exemplo, quando eu li a uh, Goethe, you know, uh, ele, fala, ele, ele escreve este livro sobre a viagem no Rio e é, é um texto bem bonito sobre natu natura, mas este é uma classe literati, não? E com educação, com... E eu, eu acho que eles estão conectando a literatura, um, os poemas, poe, 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 <risos> poetry, com uh, os paisagens, não? Eu, eu, eu não sei, mas eu acho que, por exemplo, você colocar um paisagem, poesia, obrigado. Você coloca um paisagem de Constable em frente de um, um paisano que mora no, no fazenda, eu acho ele não vai ter um reação. Não sei, mas this is my perspective. I don't think the general population at that time was interested in landscapes. I think it was a literary movement that had a visual um, form. That's, I don't know, maybe tell me if you arrived at a different perspective on that, but that's my impression. So I don't think the, the romanticism uh, perspective of nature is that relevant because it was such a small group and it was largely, in my opinion, largely a literary reaction. E, e, a, e a natureza em si, daí tu vês como, como algo bem, pela tua perspectiva, uh, algo inalcançável muito mais do que uma obra de arte. É nesse sentido também. Sim, é, mas eu não, eu não li muito de, sobre esta história, mas sim, eu acho que é, foi um semelhante, não? É. É, semelhante cultural, mas... Eu acho, não, até hoje, não, tem é, um, a, o appreciation de natura, às vezes é uma coisa elite, não, porque, um, não sei, mas a é, maioria da população não pode visitar os parques nacionais, não pode uh, assistir documentais sobre natura, não, então, tem este elemento classista é, dentro, dentro o fenomenologia de natura e eu acho que foi mais forte durante é, este período. Sim, não porque a gente pode até pensar, né, também nessa perspectiva que tu colocas assim, uh, muita, muito, muito, a maioria, a grande maioria da população não tem, não tem condições financeiras de fazer uma viagem, mas por meio de uma imagem, né, de um grande canyon ou por uh, a imagem de, de recifes, de corais na Grécia, sei lá, né, é que ela consegue ter acesso a essa natureza, né, não, não de uma forma natural, né, mas através de fotografias, de imagens, né. É, yeah, esta é uma questão, não? A, a acessibilidade e uh, todo mundo quer que a os, os, os população um, tenha responsabilidade ecológica, não? Mas uh, como este vai funcionar sem um relação 
uh, íntima com Natura, não? Eu não sei, eu não sei. Mas obrigado, Guilherme. O, o perspectivo de história de arte é sempre ótimo, um prazer, não? E Nick, Nicholas, tem alguma mais alguma coisa? Sure, buddy. I have many questions. Uh, one, 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 one thing that I would like to say, because people were talking about like uh, the Cartesian problem, and one thing that I that I work on my pieces is like the Cartesian problem of like dividing the agent and the environment is like it's it's even a real problem for research in artificial intelligence because we 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 have a lot of problems when we do this kind of division and it's really hard to i don't know like try to define what it means for an agent to be a part of the environment because the environment is like in the context of AI, the environment is an algorithm and the agent is also an algorithm. And is what does it mean for an algorithm to be inside of another algorithm? Like, I have no idea, but like it's, it's hard, it's a real problem. And I, 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 I put a commentary on the beginning of your presentation. I couldn't speak because I'm so sick. I'm just like pouring snot out of my nose but i took some medicine and i'm like a little bit better now so you're, you're having a you're having a very phenomenological experience it sounds yeah, like. very phenomenological experience my friend and uh the thing that i that i that i put out is like i'm gonna read the thing that i said that is the distinction between natural versus technological uh artificial is also quite interesting in the transhumanist debate <clears throat> sorry i don't know if you i don't know if you like understand what is the transhumanist debate but like this this whole philosophy of human augmentation of the possibility is that like of the, uh um what's the word the, the event when that's gonna happen uh uh that's what i want to say that's what i want to say actually like because many people view singularity transhuman... yeah singularity yeah yeah thanks yeah many people view like transhumanism like something like a uh, human be humans becoming cyborgs and uh nanotechnology inside of human bodies and stuff like that but when you but like the core idea of transhumanism as an anthropological movement is like human beings define uh redefining their own nature you understand like we transcending our own nature and uh if you if you for example if you pick like the the oldest the oldest the the, the oldest human history the written human history i'm sorry is the the epic of gilgamesh the epic of gilgamesh is a story about a guy who wanted to be immortal That's a transhumanist tale. <laughs> and like histories of people like wanting to transcend death or wanting to transcend illness or wanting to transcend like the bodily limitations is like, it's human in nature. Humans want to do that. If you see, and, and now like today, even today, like people like, I don't know, like I have two screws on my shoulder that keep my shoulder in place. Yeah and people who have i don't know a pacemaker on their heart or people who wear glasses like are these the, the the idea that like actually uh transhumanism like the first transhuman the first augmented human would be like the first ape that pick up a staff to be able to walk better that's technological augmentation for uh Yeah, that's the idea technological augmentation oh no uh, nick i think i think that's so dead on and especially studying um archaeology it's like uh i think we tend to over -drama dramatize whatever is new and, and shiny you know today we sort of tend to put it in this sort of revolutionary framework um And of course, there's questions about social acceleration, and, and maybe yeah, maybe yeah. we maybe we are at a watershed moment in technology. But I don't get that impression when you look back in the last you know sixty thousand years of technological development. There's little revolutions happening all the time. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. 
I agree with you. And like, uh, uh, there is a, like an interesting thing, like transhumanism is like this also, uh, the, we can define as an anthropological movement. Like we are trying to redefine what it means to be human. But there is also like a big ethic, big ethical questions, which I think are really interesting to debate because when you start to think, when you start talking about, uh, I don't know, like things like cloning, like then ethics comes really hard and we really have to talk about this kinds of things. But uh, when we, when people bring like this sort of discussion, ethical debates about transhumanism, people usually have this, like, as you said, like this image that transhumanism is like something out of a cyberpunk novel. And it's actually like something in my opinion that is really fundamentally human like try to use technology like use our inventions and artifacts that we build to try to better our way of living you know we have been doing that since i don't know we made socks and shoes and stuff like that uh well, and also you, you mentioned uh you mentioned gilgamesh and i actually forgot to put this in my thing but like I think I read the the Genesis as a ecological story. I mean, I don't know how you interpret the Garden of Eden and you know the the breaking between um, human humankind and the rest of life. But I I think like from the get go, you know, basically our most fundamental stories are like ecological warning uh, fables. Yes. Yes. And. Yes. I don't know. I just think that that is important. Like this is not this this ecological crisis question is not a new concern. It it, it goes back at least to the beginning of human literature. That's a, that's an interesting point. I haven't thought about it, but that's actually maybe, an interesting point. Maybe your your view is um, biased because you live in the era of ecological crisis. So you're reading your interpretation of the classical texts and myths and so on is ecological uh, when they address different issues but uh, i think there is there is something there is something there uh, that is um, <clears throat> worth uh, exploring but um, yeah once again we have to to consider that everything um, that we've been talking about it's is correlated uh, our experience is not uh, uh, separate, set apart from, from the, the way things are given to us uh, and they appear to us. So that's phenomenology for you. <laughs> so what, in, in what extent is our reading of transhumanism, for instance, or the ecological crisis and the idea that, that uh, humans have always tried to transcend their mortality uh, through technology? Is, is it, was it in fact that way or is there something fundamentally different in our experience nowadays that, uh, that uh, makes us interpret that those experiences, those earlier experiences as, um, as similar? Or is it our experience somewhat um, intensified, uh, an intensified experience of that? I think for instance, Hans Jonas, I think, is a, an, an author that helps us understand the, the way uh, that um, the uh, ancient, uh, ancient Greece uh, experience of, of technology and their had ethical and political experience experiences are limited to uh, human surroundings, to the police, to the city. Uh, and nowadays, our policy policies, the world, the globe, the earth. So I think there's a fundamental difference there. But we can also look at, at every ethical uh, enterprise as a, 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 an attempt to inhabit the world. And therefore, it's, it is ecological by definition. Oikos, constituting a home, a home that is discursively uh, uh, organized right? with meaning, a meaningful home. So, so that that e e every ethical enterprise and political et enterprise may be read, may be interpreted as 
some kind of ecological in, in some kind of ecological fashion. But we have also to account for uh, the differences between the ecological experience in other times and our own ecological experience. And our own ecological experience is that of uh, 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 a time where one action is capable, cap one human action, one individual's action is capable of destroying the basic, basic condi conditions of our existence in our, on Earth. So I don't think that is the same experience that uh, some guy in the Lascaux caves made while painting those those paintings. I don't know. I think there's a qualitative di difference here that uh, needs to be accounted for. Thais, por favor. Alô? Oi, estão me ouvindo? <laughs> Eu perdi metade da apresentação do John, porque eu, a minha internet começou a cair, enfim, e eu não sou uma pessoa que eu não compreendo muito bem inglês. Na verdade, eu tive a oportunidade agora de estar estudando inglês, então, mais alguma coisa eu peguei. Eu espero contribuir com a minha experiência de vida, no caso, sobre a cerca da consciência ecológica e tal. Uma coisa que eu fiquei pensando era... Eu venho lá do interior de Erechim, do interior mesmo. Então, minha família toda é, tem produção de alimentos, produção de flor, trabalha diretamente com a terra, né? E desde que eu me conheço por gente, a ideia é que, na verdade, eles não têm consciência ecológica nenhuma, de preservação nem nada, apesar de eles ter a intimidade, né? É muita intimidade quando tu trabalha com a terra e, o teu, e a tua... A tua economia depende dela, né? É um pouco estranho e contraditório, na verdade, tu não ter essa ideia de ter que preservar aquilo que tu tá manipulando. Enfim, uma coisa que eu fiquei pensando era se realmente a intimidade com a natureza faz com que as pessoas criem essa consciência. Porque eu penso que, pela minha experiência, isso... Não aconteceu. Eu fui, na verdade, incentivada a procurar outra natureza. Não aquela, não vivenciar aquela. Oh, ótimo, Thaís. Este ponto, é, é, eu, eu queria notar que... Um, é, é uma coisa que eu notei quando eu mudei aqui, é que a associação de um, rural, ruralidade, por fazendas com natura, não? E do meu perspectiva, são coisas bem diferentes e, e neste caso de Rio Grande do Sul, só tem partes bem pequenas de natura ainda. Uh, tem florestas uh, preservados mas quando você um, faz uma viagem daqui até cruzamos o estado, é, é fazendas, é, é, tudo está totalmente manipulado, feito de humanidade e, e um, é difícil achar um lugar uh, natural em sentido, é, é um ecossistema funcionando, não? Mas em termos de, um, então, do meu perspectiva, uma fazenda, uma, uma fazenda não é um espaço natural porque não tem este sistema ecológica funcionando, não? Mas, no mesmo lado, sim, tem mais contato com bichos, uh, as estreias, e tem esta questão de eles eles precisaram, uh, precisaram trabalhar, não? Duro. Então, este talvez vai afetar uh, a pers uh, perspectiva deles. E, e, sem dúvida, não? Tem muitas pessoas que fugiram um lugar bonita, natural, uh, cheio de vida para uma cidade suja, uh, cheia, baru barulhento. Então, você colocar um, um ponto importante que é um contato que a natura não necessariamente criar uma consciência uh, positiva em termos de, de ecologia. 
mas é, é um tópico complicado, não? Né? Provavelmente depende a comunidade, depende os valores, depende o ontologia das da contexto um, deles, não? Né? Porque obviamente tem comunidades que moram na floresta, depende de natura, que tem muito respeito de natura também, não? Né? Então vai ser interessante uh, procurar qual a diferença entre os dois, não? Sim. Obrigada, John. Eu vou, vou só fazer um comentário aqui, uh, mas vou fazer em português, para, porque tem a ver com esta questão da, que a Thais colocou. Quando estávamos, uh, vocês estavam justamente referindo essa necessidade de uma aproximação à, à natureza para poder, de certa forma, lidar com a crise ecológica e com... Uh, um, com uma certa apreciação da própria natureza. Uh, Lembrei-me daquele elemento logo no início da tua apresentação, John, uh, do, do autor, do Parsons, fazer uma... Uh, confundir, de certo modo, uh, a paisagem com a natureza, etc. E uma das experiências que é fundamental aí, e que é uma, uma experiência muito da modernidade, não é? É justamente a experiência dessa cisão, dessa separação, de que tu falavas agora de alguém que, por exemplo, se, se migra do campo para a cidade, não é? E, de certo modo, tem uma experiência de cisão, de ruptura, uh, na sua, de uma dimensão que assume contornos existenciais até, não é? Uh, e, 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 e talvez a experiência da paisagem é justamente a experiência dessa, dessa dualidade, desse, dessa duplicidade, que é um afastamento, ou seja, uma ruptura, da, do, dos indivíduos relativamente a, essa, a esse ciclo da natureza, digamos assim, do qual eles fazem parte, e ao mesmo tempo a, 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 o sentimento de uma necessidade, de uma, a, de uma reaproximação dessa, dessa integração, digamos assim, a, a respeito da natureza. Então, quando nós falamos já de uma certa forma de apreciação da natureza e da necessidade dessa apreciação da natureza, Uh, no sentido de lidarmos com a crise ecológica, talvez nós estejamos já a partir de um ponto em que já se deu essa ruptura, em que há uma consciência dessa ruptura, dessa crise. E é justamente a, a, a consciência de crise que é preciso cultivar. Talvez nesta experiência que a Thais aqui mencionou, é, embora as pessoas já vivam num mundo que é marcado por essa cisão, e elas utilizem as ferramentas e a própria visão do mundo or, or, que, que se organiza em torno dessa cisão, ou seja, aplicando a tecnologia à natureza e vivendo, por exemplo, do agronegócio, que já não é bem uma natureza, não é? Como tu dizias. Talvez elas não tenham ainda experienciado hum, a crise, ou seja, essa, esse afastamento Uh, relativamente à natureza e a necessidade de, de, de uma reaproximação, que é também, de certa forma, uma necessidade de reconsideração das nossas relações com a natureza e também uma necessidade de reconsideração dos valores que organizam essas, essas relações. Então, talvez aqui tenha, seja um ponto até interessante. Ou seja, e nós vemos isso, por exemplo, na relação no caso da bioética, por exemplo, no caso do tratamento dos animais, não é? Para muitas pessoas que vivem no campo, matar um animal não é um problema. Então, e não, é, e não deixa de ser curioso também que muitos destes movimentos ambientalistas de, 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 de preservação da natureza, de defesa dos direitos dos animais, surjam num, num ambiente urbano. Ou seja, um ambiente em que a, a experiência da cisão, a experiência da, da ruptura relativamente à, à natureza e aos seus ciclos, etc., um, é muito mais, está muito mais presente. Então, eu, eu achei muito interessante esta observação da Thais, porque, de facto, é, é muito... É, 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 eu acho que é um, é um ponto decisivo nesta nossa análise. Ou seja, talvez nós tenhamos, estejamos a partir, desde logo, da experiência da cisão e de um mundo organizado em torno dessa experiência, não é? Um mundo tecnológico, que lida com a natureza de um modo tecnológico. Um, quando, na verdade, há muita gente que já vive dessa forma, mas que nunca experienciou essa, 
essa ruptura. E, e isto também ajuda a compreender um pouco a discussão, o, o, as, uh, os comentários, quer os teus, quer o do Nicolas, uh, a respeito quer do trans, transhumanismo, quer da visão ecológica, da leitura ecológica, dos clássicos, não é? da, 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 da literatura ocidental, digamos assim. Uh, que, que talvez nós estejamos também já a lê-los a partir desta cisão. E, portanto, tínhamos alguma dificuldade em compreender como, por exemplo, o, o, como, como as pessoas estavam integradas, de certo modo, nessa, numa certa natureza. Claro que podemos sempre questionar o que é essa natureza, Isso, essa é outra questão que está associada. Mas eu, eu acho muito interessante este ponto de vista, porque é um ponto de vista que acaba por, de certa forma, mostrar o paradoxo em que nós vivemos. Ou seja, um paradoxo em que vivemos no meio de uma crise, mas uma crise que, eh, e essa crise tem impactos, mas numa crise que, de certa forma, reproduz, tem, um, tem alguma coisa que, permite, que lhe permite reproduzir os seus processos, os seus mecanismos, e não, não os colocar em questão. E talvez isso seja um tema que eh, não, se coloque não só às pessoas que vivem no campo, mas também a muitas que estão... Na, na, nas cidades, não é? num ambiente mais urbano, e que nunca experienciaram essa cisão, embora a vivam todos os dias. This uh, one last point I just want to make uh, this idea of the the benefits, the the quantifiable benefits to uh, exposure to nature, um, which is interesting because. Talvez daí seu, seu, sua família não notaram os benefícios que eles estão recebendo do seu ambiente, mas está acontecendo uh, em qualquer forma, não? Se eles, se eles perceberam ou não, não? E, e um, também é interessante se um, a comunidade médica... Uh, aceitaram ou necessidade tem acesso de natura, talvez vai mudar o policia muito, não? E, e eu penso, o, o, por exemplo, exercício, não? Uh, fazer esse exercício. Não, 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 não discutimos muito sobre a filosofia de exercício, qual o valor de fazer exercício, uh, se exercício ajuda ou não, ou qual é exercício, aceitamos que é algo que todo mundo precisar, não? Para ter uma vida normal. Então, se conseguimos aceitar este, esta realidade que todo mundo precisar na altura, na vida deles, talvez vai ajudar a modificar os policias ou questões de acesso, se criar um direito de acessar natura vai modificar uh, muitas coisas, não? E também tem estas questões filosóficas, mas tem um outro questão mais prático, não? Mas para se sobreviver, não? Eu acho este é um, é um caminho interessante, não? Sim, é, eu percebo que eles não têm consciência mesmo dos benefícios, e, e eles também são ignorantes, no sentido que eles não aceitam nada que tu fale o contrário, por conta de... Ele, uh, eles entendem que tudo o que eles fazem, que eles fizeram, é cultural, né? É na sociedade, enfim, no, no lugar lá. Uh, é sofrido. Então, eles, eles incentivaram nós, os jovens, a sair porque é muito sofrido, porque é ruim, então a gente acabou criando esse preconceito, é um preconceito, né? E tu só percebe depois que tu chega na cidade, tu começa a trabalhar numa empresa, e tu, tu vai perceber só quando tu tem essa experiência de chegar à cidade, e quando tu quer retornar, tu não tem nenhum tipo de política que tá auxilia nesse sentido. Todas as políticas são para tu sair. Então, tu e, lá, em casa... E quando... Quando você, uh, você gosta de visitar uma, uma experiência uh, positiva para você? Não, para mim não é. Porque eles estão sempre em sofrimento. Meu sabe? Deus. Aí, então, não, não é interessante para mim. Se eu, se eu for, 
e não visitar minha família, talvez sim, se eu vá num lugar onde que haja natureza e eu consiga entrar em contato com ela. E tem algumas coisas que eu parei de fazer também, né, que eu acredito que não é viável, mas, por exemplo, eu gostaria de ser vegetariana e eu ainda não consigo, <risos> mas eu tô tentando evitar e eu chego lá e tento colocar, a dizer, não, olha, tô tentando colocar minha opinião sobre aquilo. Uh, na verdade, uh, não, eu sei que não vai ter retorno. O retorno que eu recebo é sempre, sempre um retorno crítico, ruim. Então, eu tento não mais intervir. Porque é. a, a única coisa que eu estou fazendo é criar atritos quando, quando eu tento fazer isso. É, <risos> Mas é complicado. É, é, parece qualquer família, né? Sempre um, dois lados de, da moeda, né? <risos> Ótimo, Thaís. Uh, eu, eu, realmente, eu pessoalmente não, não, não tenho mais uh, adições para o tópico hoje, não? Eu, eu, eu não sei se mais alguém tem alguma questão ou algum comentário a fazer. Não? Eu ia só então fazer umas últimas observações, desta vez relativamente ao texto que o, que o John escolheu. Como ele disse, é um texto interessante porque procura apresentar algumas posições ou, uh, relativamente a esta relação entre a estética e a natureza, entre o belo, a experiência do belo e a nossa percepção, etc. Um, mas também é um texto muito relativamente polémico em algumas das formulações e, e no sentido de, não tanto de discutir com o texto, não é isso, mas de complementar, se vocês tiverem interesse uh, em, em explorar essa dimensão, que nós agora também falámos um pouco mais no fim, de uma certa ética ambiental, de valores ligados à relação com a natureza, etc., Uh, e que fomos falando também quando falávamos do Heidegger, um, tem o texto do Heidegger que se chama A Questão da Técnica, que é um, é um belo texto sobre, sobre esta questão da nossa relação com, com a natureza, a forma com, o modo como a tecnologia e a, a, a visão tecnológica informa a nossa relação atual com a natureza. Mas tem também, eu estava aqui olhando para o, para o texto que o João nos sugeriu, e ele diz assim, a dado momento, diz assim, uh, porque é que este tipo de apreciação, uh, uh, bom, não importa, o que ele diz é, é que uh, o facto, cri, criticando o pós-modernismo, ele diz que uh, o, o facto das coisas naturais não terem o autor, a explicaria, de certa forma, uh, a ausência de um debate crítico e de, e de eh, eh, padrões normativos para a natureza. O que eu queria dizer é, é o seguinte, isto não é bem verdade, ele próprio acaba por reconhecer depois que não é bem assim, mas a ética ambiental está cheia destes, destes debates acerca das, de, de uma certa normatividade e de como devemos um, relacionarmos com a natureza a partir de perspectivas muito distintas. Um, então eu sugeria, por exemplo, relativamente à questão da beleza, Há um autor clássico norte-americano, que certamente o John já ouviu falar, que é o Aldo Leopoldo. Uh, tem, não sei se, se, se conhecem, se não conhecem, eu vou colocar aqui o nome. Ele não, é propriamente, não era propriamente um filósofo. Um, era um agrónomo que trabalhava em conservação também nos anos 30 do... do e que justamente procura abordar a, a nossa relação com a natureza a partir de uma perspectiva estética. Uh, Ele não tem uma, uma obra, digamos, um, onde apresenta o seu sistema filosófico. Ele tem um pequeno livrinho que se chama uh, uh, Sand County Almanac. Eu posso depois compartilhar com, com vocês no, no nosso, uh, no, lá no Drive que é basicamente, uma, tem um conjunto de descrições das suas experiências na natureza e depois tem uma parte final que se chama The Upshot, onde ele basicamente resume a sua perspectiva uh, relativamente à, à nossa relação com a natureza e que valores é que devem organizar essa relação. É uma perspectiva ecologicamente orientada, ele dá uma definição de, de beleza que tem a ver com a integridade do sistema ecológico e propõe a nossa relação com, com os ecossistemas e com a própria terra como se fôssemos parte de uma grande comunidade, 
uh, no sentido de uma grande cidade, digamos assim. Então é muito interessante, isso depois é desenvolvido por um outro, um outro autor, uh, do ponto de vista mais uh, conceitual, que é o Jay Baird. Então eu, eu recomendo esses dois autores, há muitos outros, o autor que o John recomendou refere também um do biocentrismo, que é o, o, é o Taylor. Como é que está? Mas, mas deem uma olhada, porque são autores que discutem estas nossas, esta nossa relação com a, com a natureza. A forma também de como ela implica sempre uma, tem uma dimensão estética, uma espécie de aprendizagem também associada, aprendizagem dos sentidos, das emoções, associada a essa relação. Uh, e vale bem a pena, o, o texto do Aldo Leopoldo vale a pena só como obra literária, é um texto lindíssimo, recomendo particularmente um capítulo que se chama, é uma, uma passagem, é, nem chega a ser um capítulo, que se chama Thinking Like a Mountain, e acho, dá o título em português ao, à tradução portuguesa, que é Pensar como uma Montanha. E, e vale bem a pena, por causa da descrição de uma, de uma situação em que ele pela qual ele passou quando era bem jovem e que mudou completamente a visão dele relativamente à, à natureza. Uh, como esse há vários outros autores, mas eu acho que esse é uma boa porta de entrada para uma ética da Terra e para vocês também terem uma ideia de que este debate não é propriamente novo e que há muita gente já a trabalhar nisto, principalmente na área da ética ambiental. Uh, estamos a aproximar-nos do final, vocês devem ter reparado o professor Itamar teve de sair um pouquinho antes que tinha um compromisso marcado, mas fiquei eu aqui a assegurar tudo, e o John, agradeço ao John a apresentação, foi brilhante, foi muito boa a interatividade, de facto, foi uma, uma ótima forma de, de... Obrigado, foi uma prazer. Professor, eu posso fazer Conta uma dele. pergunta no fim? Sim, sim, claro, claro. John, Pode fazer já. Uh, tá, John, é... obrigado né, pela, pela sua apresentação, foi muito instigante. É sobre aquela questão da relação do, do ser humano e a natureza na experiência estética. E eu achei que seria fundamental compreender que todas as propriedades e qualidades do ser humano, por exemplo, as mais elevadas, desde a ação intencional, ação voluntária e consciente, possam ser compreendidas dentro de um universo natural. Porque isso possibilitaria entender como que, por exemplo, a natureza ela tem uma relação com a arte, no sentido de que possam haver estruturas universais. Eu pensei essas estruturas universais semelhante à questão da linguagem do Chomsky. Às vezes a experiência estética poderia ter algumas estruturas universais como a linguagem tem, mas isso não seria incompatível com questões culturais, étnicas e específicas e as experiências de cada indivíduo. E se nós in possamos entender a re essa relação da arte com a, com a natureza e o ser humano inserido dentro desse contexto artístico, Acho que a questão 3, ela poderia também ser, ter um benefício, porque se nós pensarmos na justificativa de uma norma ética, e nós queremos apelar para uma filosofia ecológica, por exemplo, que fundamenta a norma ética ou justifica, ou, ou justifica na relação do ser humano com a natureza, pensando as relações harmônicas, uh, intraespecíficas e interespecíficas entre as espécies, entre o, os indivíduos, pensando em relações simbióticas de cooperação para tentar fundamentar uma norma ética que diz que seria mais vantajoso para os humanos estabelecer uma relação mais é, de cooperação e colaboração com a natureza, não de exploração e depreciação. Se nós nos considerarmos dentro de, de um contexto natural, evitando interpretações uh, mais antropológicas. né? É, além disso... Tem, quando eu estava lendo seu texto, eu pensei numa questão que o Eduardo Moore levanta, que é o, o, a falácia naturalista. Se nós pensarmos no ser humano não inserido dentro desse plano na, na, mais nat, natural, mas excedendo como se tivesse características ou qualidades não, é, que estariam fora desse universo mais é, naturalista. Por quê? Porque a falácia naturalista <coughs> determina que é um erro categorial ou um erro lógico fazer uma relação entre a natureza e questões, por exemplo, éticas e morais. Então, a, a, a 
a filosofia ecológica poderia encontrar um problema de tentar justificar uma norma ética se pensar que existem qualidades que não seriam, ou propriedades que não seriam né, naturais. Então, é, eu gostaria de saber a sua opinião, se você entende que existem propriedades ou qualidades que poderiam é, ser, estar fora, por exemplo, desse universo mais naturalista. E não só isso, mas os produtos dela. Por exemplo, representações e imaginações que poderiam resultar numa obra de arte feita por um ser humano, se ela poderia, então, ser considerada como algo que excede ou é, extrapola esse universo mais né, da, da, da nossa espécie mesmo, da, da natureza. E, e se sim, então, isso poderia trazer alguns problemas para a tentativa de justificação da norma ética dentro de uma base ecológica, porque acho difícil, eu penso, relacionar o, eco, uh, o ecologismo com algumas perspectivas antropocêntricas ou, que, ou até dualistas. É, eu gostaria de saber a sua opinião. E obrigado pela, pela apresentação. Oi, já, Diogo, é um, um questão difícil responder em 30 segundos, mas um, eu eu acho, é, se eu entendo, eu acho que um, para mim, para encapsular todo este projeto, é, eu, eu vou dizer que eu acho que um coisa que na natura traz o, o re, é, reconhecimento que não nós não estamos os criadores de universo. Eu acho por isso é criar medo, criar, é criar surpresa e, e criar um, um fascinante, né? fascinação. E temos de como vamos aplicar esta percepção com uma base étnica, comportamento, policia, é uma boa questão, e esta é uma questão fundamental para meu projeto, eu vou tentar é, explorar esta questão de uma forma bem pequena, né? com cultura material na casa doméstica. Mas se você pode cavar embaixo do, do projeto, acho que vai achar estas questões mais uh, filosóficas sobre um, o lugar de humanidade vis-à-vis o universo e qual o qual um, efeitos resultados étnicas éticas eh, depende esta relação mas é um é um tópico enorme mas o seu percepção é, é, é bem um, bem bem uh, ajudante não 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 acabamos o tempo não Acho que sim, se mais ninguém tiver nenhum comentário ou observação. Ou então, John, mais uma vez, muito obrigado, foi muito instigante a, a apresentação e a discussão, o debate foi muito bom. É um tema que me é muito caro e eu acho que todo mundo aqui está bem envolvido e bem interessado neste, nestas questões. Um, voltamos para a semana aqui, se vocês tiverem interesse nestes temas, mais uma vez eu sublinho, estão disponíveis o os, os vídeos do Seminário de Teorias da Justiça, nós estamos a conversar um pouco sobre esta relação entre sociedade e natureza também. Uh, muito obrigado, John, muito obrigado a todos, e vemos-nos para a semana, então. Um abraço. Ótimo. Tchau, tchau, tchau pessoal. Bom resto de semana. Tchau. Ah. No, no.